Well, good morning, Westgate Chapel. Pastor Chris here. Um, I'm here at my house on a beautiful Tuesday morning. I can't believe the blessing from the Lord that our weather has been. Um, many of you might have seen and followed me on Instagram. I've literally been praying, God, give us unseasonably hot and warm weather. Lord, both for um, really to destroy this virus, but also just the mental health as we walk through this crisis. And God's been so faithful. Anyway, I'm here at the house, and uh, if you hear some squealing in the background, uh, Vanessa's out um, homeschooling Sophia and Lucas. So uh, yeah, interesting days, huh? Our new normal. But uh, today, I want to just come and talk to you about... Um, the eighth installment or step from the Personal Revival series uh, by Tozer. Um, and the topic we have today is deliberately narrowing your interests. So deliberately narrowing your interests. And uh, that's a really hard one for us, isn't it? Um, I believe it's something that the Lord's been saying to us for a really long time, even at Westgate Chapel since 2015. Many of you would remember... Um, Craig Pinnell had a word that we were to prepare. That goes along with this, narrowing our interests. So we begin to prepare our lives. We begin to push into the Lord. The Lord gave us a few years ago a word. Pastor Alec has talked about it. And I think as a church, um, we've thought about create. how do we create more capacity for the things of the Lord, for what he has called us to do? Do you know that you aren't just saved, but the moment that you come into the kingdom, you have a calling and you have a purpose. So it's not just trying to live apart from sin. We are tr we are called to live into the purposes of God. So if there are sins and weights that are keeping us back from walking in the purposes of God, we have to deliberately narrow our interests or we're displeasing the Lord and we're not going to see the fullness in our lives of what he's called us to. Amen. So anyway, we're in a divine pause. That's what I believe the Lord's saying. I believe it's ordained by the Lord, but he has some steps for us. So today I want to just walk through um, this topic. Um, first, I'm just going to talk a little bit about what Tozer was saying uh, when he wrote the book, I believe in the 50s. Uh, I want to just mention and touch on a few scriptures. Then I really believe um, that God's given us a prophetic word for this time. So I just want to deliver that to you. Um, let's start with Tozer. Um, I got to keep this moving. I guess we're two minutes in now. Um, deliberately narrow your interest, Tozer says. The Christian life requires that we be specialists. And I just want to pause here for a second and just say, we live in the culture, a culture that despises, I think, really the idea of specialists. We are taught to be all things um, we're taught to be a jack of all trades, right? Like we don't really have necessarily specialists. We're supposed to be our own construction worker, our own gardener, our own baker, our, you know, we, we just, in, in our culture, we're trying to be a DIY for everything. Well, what Tozer's saying here is in the kingdom of God, if you'll narrow your interests, God will enlarge your heart. He goes on to say, Jesus only seems to the unconverted man and woman to be the motto of death. It seems miserable. But a great company of happy men and women can testify that it became to them a way into a world infinitely wider and richer than anything they had ever known before. Christ is the essence of all wisdom, beauty, and virtue. To know him in growing intimacy is to increase in the appreciation of all things good and beautiful. The mansions of the heart will become larger when the doors are thrown open to Christ and closed against the world and sin. Um, he says, try it. So, wow, it's really good, really hard to do. And like a fish in water, we don't really understand. We don't see the water in this culture that we live in where everything's so busy, everything's moving so fast. We can't just be like the world, Tozer's saying, but we've got to become, see everything. Jesus only is the way he said it, but it doesn't, and that doesn't mean that there's the sacred and the secular, 
but that we have to see and, and, and engage all of life through this lens of what is God calling us to do? What is our kingdom kingdom calling and our kingdom, kingdom purpose? <clears throat> so just two quick things I want to say moving to the scripture now. Uh, the first scripture that came to mind was 2 Timothy 2.4. Paul writes, Timothy, my dear son, be strong through the grace that God gives you in Christ Jesus. You have heard me teach these things that have been confirmed by many reliable witnesses. Now teach these truths to other trustworthy people who will be able to pass them on to others. If Paul's speaking like this, we should listen closely. He says, endure suffering along with me as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. What is that suffering? That soldiers don't get tied up in the affairs of civilian life, for they cannot please the officer who enlisted them if they do. Athletes cannot win the prize unless they follow the rules. Hey, we know that starting an exercise regime or a new eating plan, it it makes us suffer at first, right? Like uh, Mike and I, we were together because we do the stream together. So um, we were actually together a little bit on Sunday and we were practicing doing sets of 20 push-ups. Well, I woke up today and I was suffering a little bit. I was sore and I texted him and he said, hey, keep going. And you know, you know that, that there's gonna be times of suffering. We're gonna have to reorder our lives but we won't win the prize if we don't follow what God's laid out before us. So narrow your interests as a soldier in the kingdom of God. Point or scripture two, Hebrews 12, one and two. I got to keep going. Therefore, I love this scripture. Since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses. And who is he talking about? Well, in chapter 11, he's just talked about Noah and Moses and Abraham and Sarah if we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses of the faith, let us also lay aside every weight and every sin which clings so closely and let us run with endurance the race, there we are, that language again, that's set before us. We look to Jesus, the founder and the perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him. How many of you know that there's a goal here? Jesus has, and it's what I believe I'm going to deliver in just a moment, there's an end to this. There's a joy to this. So we never just, Jesus doesn't want us to give up things just for the sake of giving up. He's not trying to spoil our fun. These boundaries are to keep us safe and direct us towards the kingdom of heaven. Looking to Jesus, the founder and the perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, yes, but now he's seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Wow. And so we ask ourselves, just like our mothers and fathers of the faith, are we being foreigners and sojourners, the scripture says, not just getting entangled with the cares and the culture of this world. Church, please listen. I'm trying to live into this. We cannot get weighed down living life just like those um that don't follow Christ, but are we set on God's goals and are we laying aside every weight that keeps us from his calling in our lives? Because if we're not, that ultimately becomes sin. Strong words today, but this can be done in the joy of the Spirit, okay? Number three, I'm going quickly here. So what do I believe like believe that the Lord is saying to us in this season? Well, we've talked about what Ricky Moore said. Uh, Pastor Alec has talked to you about it on Sunday, this idea of Passover. And I believe the word of the Lord to us during this season of Passover is that God's given us an opportunity, a divine reset. Many of us have started down this path to create capacity, um, to prepare, but we we just haven't been able to really hit the reset button. But I believe God's given us a pause. We must reevaluate right now and we must get ready. And I'm going to share that. That's going to be the third point here. But the first one that the Lord is saying is reevaluate, reorder your lives because number one, we have to have clean hands. Hey, listen, God gives us things in the natural first. 
um, to help us understand the spiritual. I believe one of the points of this coronavirus is God is showing us, just like in the natural, we're realizing, wow, these germs hang out. We got to be more clean, more careful, more distance. And I'm going to sin and from disobedience than we ever have been. Please hear me today. This is an imperative. We have walked through a season of grace. God's been teaching us for the last, I don't know, 20 years, the goodness of God and grace of God because of the many of the misconceptions of the holiness movement of the past. But grace is an excuse to sin. Grace is an empowerment. It's a chorus. It's a charismata. It's a gift of the Spirit that enables us to live into our divine purposes. So please don't get caught up. We're, we're, we don't want to hear strong messages right now, but I'm telling you, God's saying, clean your hands, remove every speck of leaven. We're going back to the idea of the, the Passover. We can't have anything that puffs up or distorts the calling God has in our lives right now. Look through your house is what he told the Israelites. Look in the corners. Are we willing to do that in this time where God's put a divine pause? Look in every corner. Get out every speck of sin, every bit of disobedience, every place where we're letting ourselves off of the hook. Please hear me. Clean your house of living. Clean your hands. Psalms 24 says, Who can ascend to the hill of the Lord? I'm going to read for just a moment. Narrow those interests in your life that lead to sin and distraction that keep you from what God has called you and your family to do. Hear me today. I wrote down, don't delay. If the coronavirus has taught us anything in the natural, it is that we have to be more careful and cleaner than we have ever realized. I just keep hearing the scripture. Come out from among them and be ye separate, says the Lord. Would you hear that? Would you hear that with the unction? I feel the presence of the Lord. Would you hear that in your spirit today? Could I speak to you in your spirit? Come on. God's given you grace. Come out and be ye separate. Come out from the world systems. God has grace for you to do it. God has empowerment. Be clean and careful during this time. Number two, get your hands clean. Remove the leaven. Remove yourself from the systems of the world. Number two, be careful how you listen. See, God brought the Israelites out of Egypt to Sinai. Do you remember to the mountain? It was fearful. They were seeing God in a new way. There was fire, there was smoke, there was the voice. We heard on Sunday the voice of the Lord saying, see me again, see me afresh, okay? The Lord's also saying, so number two, clean. number one, clean your hands. Number two, hear my voice. It's time, church, to listen. And if we don't have clean hands, if we don't have our lives reordered, we aren't really going to be able to hear. So listen what Luke 8, 18 says. So pay attention to how you hear or listen, some translation says. To those who listen to my teaching, more understanding will be given to them. Do you want more understanding in the kingdom? But for those who are not listening, this is serious, even what they think they understand will be taken away from them. This is so important. Jesus says, Isaiah says, you were ever hearing but not hearing, ever listening but not actually understanding. Guys, if we don't get this in this season, when are we going to get it? Is there going to be a time in the future? Or if God's given you a pause right now, are you going to put off doing business with God that he's asking you to do? Is there going to be a better time? No. Listen, I'm preaching this to myself. So here's the thing. When they came to the mountain, Sinai, they saw God. It was fearful. They heard God's voice. He gave them some pretty strong instructions Listen, have clean hands. Don't If you are tainted, don't touch. Don't touch the mountain. They got terribly afraid. They said, we don't really want anything to do, the, do with this. We don't really want to listen. Um, they, said, Mo, he said, Moses, they said, Moses, would you just go listen? And, and so I think we can do that. The Israelites didn't want to listen. They wanted the preacher to listen, right? Can you identify? You know, preacher, you listen. Pastor, you listen online Bible teacher, 
Would you hear for me? Intercessor, listen. They just wanted them to listen, and we can be guilty of that. We want them to listen. Just tell me what God's saying, and then what do we do? We go on with business as usual. How did that work out for them? If we're not listening and be attentive and seeing the Lord afresh, we go back to the camp, we go to our own ideas, what happened? And we build up idolatry. We build up the golden calf. And ultimately, that behavior of not listening led them to really subverting the promises. They didn't walk into the promise of, of God. So I have this written here. Can you see the parallels here? I pray you let the Spirit hit pause. Think for just a moment. Lord, what are those ways that I just want someone else to listen? I don't want to pause. I don't want to give you the first fruits of my day whenever it is that, that the Lord's asking you to listen. But there's no reason for this to happen to us. We live in repentance before God by the Spirit of God. We clean our hands we live daily in worship, God's word, and intimacy. This is how we learn to listen. Listen, there's no shortcut. If you shortcut, you will begin to build. I think they thought, and I'm just, I'm just, many of you can remind me, I think they thought God would be okay with that. Maybe that would help them. They built this, they built an idol, you guys. Can't let that happen. So here's the third point I'm so excited to share with you. God wants us to get the leaven out as never before. Purify our ways. Learn to listen through the word and worship and intimacy. So we're just in tune. This isn't as hard and a burden as it might sound. You know, when you first start picking up those weights, oh, or you look at them, you see other people lifting in the gym, you're like, I can never attain to that. But it just takes a little bit and you just begin to go right into the rhythms of grace. Matthew um, 11, I believe 25 says, Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden. Put your yoke, put my yoke upon you. Learn of me. I'm humble. I'll teach you how to do this. I think that's what the Lord's saying today. Number three, what is the end? What is the joy set before us so we can endure the cross life that God's asking us to? I believe with all of my heart, God woke me up about two weeks ago saying the unprecedented harvest is here. I hear God saying that it's a divine reset because of an unprecedented harvest. God is getting ready to bring in an unprecedented harvest like we have never seen, but he has to have his workers. Do you understand this? It can't be the preacher. It can't just be the prophet. It can't just be the online Bible teacher. We need each of us, each of our families. God's strengthening us as families right now so that we can join together. It just can't be the 12 of us on pastoral staff. Um, it's got to be all of us, right? Jesus tells the disciples he's sending out in Luke 10 too, the harvest truly is great, but the laborers are few. Can you hear the grief in the Lord's voice? Therefore, pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. I believe this is when he sent out the 77. So it kind of goes with, it's not just the 12 apostles. It's not just these special few that are set apart. God is ripping down the walls of sacred and secular because he wants you to be clean, remove all the leaven, understand your calling, walk in this because I have an unprecedented harvest. Here's what I believe. God is finally going to have in these last days, in this third great awakening that he's preparing us for, the workers that he's always dreamed of. Can you hear that and see that today? Do you realize that you're one of them? God's been working. Look, Jesus has been looking out for these 2,000 years, and he's been seeing these white fields that are ready for harvest, and he looks over, uh, he looks over them again and again, and there aren't enough workers. But I believe that God has this time 
and getting us ready so that he can finally have the workers that he's always wanted. Harvest, unprecedented harvest in the days ahead. And I wrote this at the end to encourage you. While this is a time of great promise, it also has a time of if then. Do you understand that? Any promise, all of the covenant in scriptures is an if then. We if we will recognize that this is a time of divine pause and a time of divine reset, we will lay our if we will lay our lives before him and reevaluate our interests and heart. If we will draw close to God, see him afresh, listen closely for his voice, then. Are you ready for the then? Then we will see the harvest of God's righteousness and shalom in our lives. This isn't just for this third purpose, the, the cleaning your hands and listening to his voice. When you begin to do that, God begins to reorder, give you wisdom and understanding. Shalom is the way things always were intended to be. What does What's God's dream? What does his picture look like for you over your family? God will begin to do that. So he'll bring the then, the if then, is that we will see the harvest of God's righteousness and his shalom in your life. The then will be that God's promised land will be realized in our lives, right? He was bringing them out of Egypt to Sinai, and within 40 days of them sending out scouts, they were supposed to go into the promised land. It took them 40 years of unbelief. I don't want to go around the same mountains, do you? So here's the promise. Then we will see the greatest and the most colossal, unprecedented harvest the world has ever seen. I believe it with all my heart. It's like I can close my eyes and see all of us getting ready. Men and women and children and families all across this world, this region. And when we come back together, God's getting us ready. This, this church, please don't hear it. This is not to be a burden, but it is to be a joy. So go enjoy today. God is preparing us. God is going to finally have, I have written here, God is going to finally have, listen to this, the workers and the harvest that he has always dreamed of. I don't know, that kind of breaks my heart to hear that. Um, it's not sad, but he's been looking out for 2,000 years. He's been trying to get us strong enough, prepare a people. And I believe before he comes back, we are in the last of the last days, but I believe in the next 10, 20, 30, 40, 60, 100 years God has out before us. Grab a hold of this. He's given us a divine reset, a divine pause, so that we can finally become the workers that he's always dreamed of. Many prophetic voices have said there's, we're walking into a billion soul harvest. Can you believe for that? I believe it's what God's saying. So clean your hands. Listen more closely than ever before. Narrow all your interests. Listen, God has good things for you. You'll have different things in different seasons. Narrow your interest because we're about to see the greatest harvest that the, this world has ever seen, the greatest great awakening. So we love you. We can't wait to be with you again. We pray God's blessing over you. His face shines upon you. He gives you his peace, his shalom, and his righteousness. Be blessed today.